Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Sunday service. It is so nice to see so many faces, or upper halves of faces. Uh, it's nice to see everybody online. I love technology, right? I mean, the blessing of technology that we can still be together on a Sunday morning. It's wonderful. Good morning. I'm Kathleen Ambroso. I'm the Director of Community Outreach here at The Journey. Welcome to you. If this is your first time, maybe you made the connection with us at Easter and you're continuing to check us out, thank you. It's awesome to have you. Please make that connection with us. You can catch us if you're here in the building outside after service. I actually think we're giving away these t-shirts today, so come introduce yourself. If you're online, shout it out in chat. We would love to make that connection. Speaking of connections, please fill out the connection card. If you're here in the building, you can scan that QR code on the back of the chair. That'll get you our app, which is full of information about the church. If you're online, there's a connection card tab as well. We are so excited to have you guys here. This is great. So we got some things coming up. We have another free food distribution for our community. That's on the 29th. This may be our last one. So if you've been delaying coming out and serving with us, delay no longer. Sign up and join us. It has been so great to have some FaceTime with friends, serve together, help out our community. If you've had a friend that like, you've been wanting to introduce to the church, this is a great way to do that. Anyone and everyone is ex you know, welcome, and we are excited to have them. So please, go ahead and sign up a friend. Uh, last, we have Financial Peace University starting this week. If you're interested in learning how to have a godly perspective, wise, good advice perspective on your finances, and who doesn't need that this year, please check that out. That will be awesome. Okay, we're starting a new sermon series, Confessions of a Pastor. I'm intrigued. I think you might be too. <laughs> uh, so Chad's going to walk us through that shortly, but before that, we're going to worship together. This whole year and a half has made me appreciate the opportunity to worship together as a body, as a community. I did not realize how important that was to me until I couldn't do it. So I am looking forward to getting to share that with you guys this morning. So let's worship our Lord together. Amen. Thank you, Kathleen. Good morning, Journey family. If you're here in the building, you can go ahead and stand with us today. And even if you're at home, if you want to just kind of be with us in spirit, you can stand as well. Uh, as we get ready to just connect with and celebrate the Lord and worship, we've got a, a verse of scripture that we want to read today to just focus our minds and our thoughts on the majesty and the greatness of God. This is from uh, Psalm chapter 8, and I'm going to ask Hannah to read this. Just hear these words this morning. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. God is indescribable today. Let's sing about it. From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea, creation's revealing your majesty. From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring, every creature unique in the soul. the next one. Who has told? Who has told every lightning bolt where it should go? Or seen heavenly storehouses made and restored? You imagine the sun, Father. Who imagine the sun and give source to its light? 
yet conceals it to bring us the coolness of night. None can sing it out. amazing today. Sing, you are amazing God. Ooh. Last one. Shout it out today. He's indescribable. Indescribable. Uncontainable. You place the stars in the sky and you know them say amen every now and then it's good to just stop and think about what it means to be God capital G-O-D the question is what is our response to that what are we supposed to, to do with that the Bible says draw near to God and he will draw near to you and I believe that the best thing that we can do in our lives is to just spend time getting closer to God we have to make time to talk to him and think about him and include him in our day, we have to practice the presence of God because when you do, you'll find that that's really what we need more of, the presence of God in our lives. Sing with Leah now. There's nothing. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close Nothing can compare your olive in hope, your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of laughs when my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Oh, 
hearts long for to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, we commit to you this time, this day, our very lives. You do whatever it is that you want to do. And speak to us and change us and make us more like Jesus. Because that is what we need. Your presence, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all of God's people here and abroad said, amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're here in the building, you can have a seat. We've got something super cool to show you guys today. Last week was Easter Sunday, and we had a baptism Sunday of that week. Many of you guys were here for that or watching online. And we baptized, uh, how many people did we baptize last week? Was it eight, nine people? It was amazing. It was a wonderful day. Uh, we have a quick uh, sort of highlight reel that we want to show you of that morning. So check this out. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my Lord and Savior. Man, that was, that was so awesome to be a part of last week. We had eight people that were baptized. Uh, three of those individuals just came up Sunday morning like, hey, we want to do this today. And so it's just incredible to see that happen. We had an amazing Easter. It was great to see many faces we hadn't seen in over a year who were here in this building. We had a ton of people watching online. Uh, just a, a great experience. But one of the things I said last week, we're always celebrating Easter here at The Journey. I mean, that's why we exist as a church, because of what we celebrate on Easter. So I hope we never forget that. Uh, but man, if you uh, would like to be baptized, if you have questions about baptism, we're talking to a few other people about taking this step, please let us know. We would love to just sit down and chat a little bit about baptism, what it is and how, why we do it. And man, if you want to be all in, uh, through that step, then uh, again, please let us know. We'd love to have that conversation with you. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to have you here in this room. It's good to have all of you that are online with us today. You know, as I start today, I, I kind of want to tell you one of my favorite things that happens to me. Um, I, you know, sometimes I get a chance to go play golf and I'm out playing with maybe another person. And if you play golf and you don't have a foursome, sometimes they'll put somebody else with you, right? They'll put another person, they'll put a couple of people with you to make out a foursome. And so you start playing golf, and you're with these people like four or five hours out on the golf course. And, uh, and, and through the, the time that you're with this individual or through the, with these people, the conversation begins about what you do for a living, right? And so people start saying, hey, you know, what, you know, what do you do? And people start telling me, you know, this is what I do, this is what I work for, this is why I'm here, all that kind of stuff. But my favorite part is when they ask me what I do. Like, what do you do for a living? I'm like, oh, I'm a pastor. It's like confessional on the golf course all of a sudden. <laughs> that person says, pastor, or they call me reverend, which I hate. And they're like, reverend, I am so sorry. Like, I never use those words. I am so sorry. I've been saying those things. I didn't know this is what you did. And, man, I roll my eyes and start laughing because first, this isn't like two and a half hours of your, your whole life that you just started using those words. You use those words a lot. Let's just be honest. <laughs> Secondly, probably said those words a couple times in my life. And third, don't call me reverend. I can't stand that. But, but people kind of look at it as this moment to just be in this confessional, just confessional time because there's a pastor that's there. Now, some of you actually grew up going to a confession, right? You, you grew up in a church setting that that was part of what you did. You would walk into the church You'd walk into that little booth, and there sitting beside you with this partition between you was the priest. And for the next few moments or minutes or hours, depending on who you were, you would start sharing some. You wouldn't share all of them. You'd share some of your, your sins since the last time you, you did this. And so at the end, the priest would say, hey, you know, here's a few things you say, a few things you need to do. You're forgiven. Go about your, your life. Today, we're not on the golf course, all right? And today, we're not in the confessional booth. Today, I am in front of you, and over the next four weeks, I'm going to do something I've been wanting to do for a long time, just never had the guts to do it till now for some reason. 
We're going to go through this series called Confessions of a Pastor. And I'm hoping at the end of this, someone will turn this into a Hallmark movie because this is going to be so good and delicious. I mean, this is going to be great. I'm just kidding. I just want to share some things with you that I struggle with, intentions that I have in my life. And I want to do this because I'm pretty sure that some, most, all of you deal with it too. Now, now before I go any further, let me just say there's not going to be anything really crazy that's going to come out of this, Okay. There's not these deep, dark secrets I'm going to share with you. Whatever those things are you've been reading about, pastors, that's not the purpose of this. I'm going to disappoint some of you because you're like, oh, yeah, what's he going to say? It's not that, all right? These are, these are struggles and tensions I have. And again, I, I think they're important because I want you to understand. I know where you're coming from in your life also because I don't think we're any different. But that's why I want to begin today and talk about pastors. I want to give you some information about pastors. Some of it you know, some of it you may think you know, and some of you definitely don't know. First, some of you think, because you tell me this all the time and it's your joke and you think it's real funny, you're like, hey, you only work one day a week, and the rest of the time you're playing golf. Not true. Um, Others of you, you you kind of go the opposite way. You think pastors, all that pastors do is they sit in an office and they pray all day, they read the Bible all day, they journal all day about the things they're praying about and the things that they're reading in Scripture, and that everywhere we go, we're like, oh, bless you, God with you. I mean, that's how we speak. You know, that's not quite it either. And then you think when it it comes to a pastor, man, it would be great to work on a staff because, you know, I bet church staff, it's like church camp. Like, like you, you build a, a campfire, and everybody gets around it, and, you know, Gary comes out with his acoustic guitar, and he starts playing, and everybody's singing Kumbaya, and you do an exegesis of Malachi all day. I mean, this is like your, your, your staff meetings, and that's the way it is all the time. Again, you're off quite a bit there. But, but this is what we think sometimes when, when you think about a pastor. You, you think this is what a pastor's life looks like, not to mention your expectations. <laughs> um. I talk a lot about expectations here at The Journey, that we bring expectations into relationships. We bring expectations into our marriage. We bring expectations into our dating, into our parenting lives. We, we bring expectations, as I said last week, into what it looks like for what we expect out of Jesus. But, but there are these expectations we have, and, and, and maybe a couple of them are legit, but most of them, they're just selfish stuff. They're just selfish desires that we have. And, and we bring these things into these relationships. And it's actually detrimental to them because we never actually talk through these. We bring them into the relationship. And we think this is the way it's supposed to be. And yet we never fully deal with it. And so we don't know what the realities are. And when we figure out those realities, maybe sometimes it's too late. Well, as a pastor, I know that people bring in tons of expectations for a pastor. And I don't have time to go through them all. I'll refrain from that. Some are biblical and right, all right? But most, I'm not even quite sure they're biblical at all. And yet you may have expectations for a pastor, that this is the way a pastor is supposed to live their life, this is what their life looks like, because they're just so different than you. And in that, I'm afraid sometimes... You may look at my life and what I do and think, it's a pretty easy job. Like, you got a pretty sweet gig. This, this has got to be pretty amazing, what you get to do and the things you get to be a part of. And so I kind of sat down and I thought, what's the reality? You know, what does this look like for me and, and what I do? Well, here's the reality. I'm a visionary, an entrepreneur, a team leader, an administrator. I kind of run the HR department. I'm a community leader, a problem solver. I support our staff. I coach. I'm a counselor. I'm a spiritual guide, a teacher, a preacher, a pastor. While at the same time, I am working to maintain this healthy balance in my life. Because I like being married. And so I want to make sure that I put time and effort into my marriage. I like my kids and I want to be a good dad. I try to protect my physical, mental, and spiritual health. While looking like I got all my stuff together, right? This is what I am about. This is who I am. And I know some of you are hearing that right now. You're like, are you going to complain for the next four weeks? Because it sounds like you're complaining. (laughs) I'm not complaining at all. I love my job. I honestly am one of those people. I do not feel like I work. And some of you are like, you don't because you're a pastor. I get it. But I love what I get to do. And I feel like God has created me to do this role. 
this series is not about me complaining. It's about sharing with you who I am. It's about sharing with you that I also understand your life isn't much different. You've got a crazy schedule, and you're trying to figure out relationships, and you're trying to figure out your spiritual life and your mental health and physical life and marriage and parenting and dating and work. You're, you're trying to figure all these things out too. But I want you to know that I am the same as you, that I am not any different. But as we begin this series today, I want to kind of sit us on this, this level playing field, all right? Um, I, I can honestly tell you, I've got enough pressure on myself because in Scripture it kind of says like, hey, if you're in the role of a teacher, a pastor within a church, a leader in the church, you got some pretty big responsibilities, man. You mess up, <laughs> you're in big trouble. And so there's kind of all that pressure I've already put on myself. But as I begin today, I want to let you know that we're in this together, okay? And so I'm going to give you confession number one. If we had a drummer up here, we'd do a drum roll. But here's confession number one for you. It's going to blow you away. I am normal. Some of you are like, really, I came for that. Wow, that's not as good as I was thinking. Look, we got to have a starting point for this. I know this isn't earth shattering. I know it's not too crazy. But I want you to know that I am normal. Every once in a while, Kara and I will have somebody come up to us and like, oh, man, your marriage, I just, man, you guys got it going on. It looks like everything's great. And, you know, you got a perfect marriage. And, and wow, I mean, I wish my marriage was like that. Or, or you look at our kids, you're like, oh, your kids, I mean, they're, they're nice, they're friendly, they're polite. I mean, oh, man, you guys are just perfect. How do you do that with your kids? I wish I was that kind of parent. Here's how normal we are. I can tell you that our marriage is not perfect. You can go outside and ask my wife that. It's not. It's not perfect at all. It takes time. It takes effort. It takes patience. I tell you this a lot. It takes counseling. It takes Jesus. But we work hard to make our marriage the best we can. When it comes to parenting, I'm going to tell you the parenting, I think, is much tougher than marriage. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of time and a lot of effort. Oh, and by the way, counseling and a lot more Jesus. These are things that we have to work on. These are things that I have to work on. Just because I'm in a role of a pastor does not mean all of a sudden it's easy for me because of this role, because I'm somehow connected more to God than you are. It's not the case at all. Again, I, I'm normal. And I know some of you, you struggle with your faith and you struggle trying to follow Jesus and you struggle when it comes to taking time to read scripture and to spend time in prayer and to spend time just kind of focused on God. Hey, guess what? I struggle with some of those same things. That's why I'm here to tell you today that I am normal. And I want you to know <laughs> that I'm normal and I'm just like you. That there's no difference between us. About 15, probably 17 years ago, Kara and I were working at a church in New Jersey. And um, we were just kind of watching, you know, I, I grew up a pastor's kid, and I knew quite a few pastors, and, and it was connected with pastors and pastors in the church we were at, and we just started talking, and we said, you know what we want to be? We just want people to see that we're just normal. Like, there's nothing special. Just because we work in a church, just because we're, you know, trying to lead people, just because, Chad, you're a pastor within this church, we don't want people to put us up on some pedestal and think that we're better than everybody else, because we're not. We're normal. We struggle. There's tensions that are there. And so we made that concerted effort to make sure everywhere we went, every church that we were part of, that the people there understood just that, that we were normal just like everyone else because we struggle with the same things. We have the same tensions. I'm not some super pastor. I'm not some super Christian. I'm just like everyone else. But here's the deal. You and I, we are in this journey together. And not only that, but for all of us, I love it because I know there's incredible hope for our lives. I um, know there's hope because of Jesus. And because of the followers that he chose, if you go to Matthew chapter 4, starting with verse 18, it says, One day... As Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. 
Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. I love this because look at who Jesus chooses. Some of his first followers, they're two fishermen. If you actually look at the roles of the other disciples of the ones we actually know about, um, probably half of these followers were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. Uh, Judas, you know, we don't know exactly what he did, but he probably had to do something with finance because they put him in charge of the money. He was kind of this group's treasurer. One of the guys was a zealot. Um, This was basically a Jewish terrorist. Uh, they fully believed in the Jewish law and they were trying to get rid of the, the Roman influence and the Roman uh, occupation or occup- uh, occupying uh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem and the, 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 the nation of Israel. They were doing everything they could to get rid of the Romans. And, and Jesus chooses this group of people to be his followers. But if you look at these followers, there's something you're going to notice. He did not choose religious leaders. Like he didn't choose the, the super pastors, Right. But, but he also didn't choose the people who had their stuff together. He, he didn't choose the, the super Christians, right? He, he didn't choose that group of people to follow him. Who does he choose? He chooses these disciples, these very, very normal people. People that I would say were just like you and just like me. And for me, that gives me hope in our lives. Probably my favorite disciple Jesus chooses the one that gives me the most hope the most normal one is Peter uh Peter we know quite a bit about Peter Peter's just a different kind of character and uh Peter was all over the place but I love Peter because I think Peter just exemplifies I know who I am and that's why I connect with him so well but but maybe you too I want to look at a few episodes in Peter's life there's one the disciples are out on the boat and um, they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, the storm hits, and Jesus actually comes walking towards their boat on the water. Now, now this is definitely one of those very Peter moments, right? Matthew 14, starting with verse 28, says, Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, He was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? I I, I love this because here's Peter, and he likes to say, you know, I've got this faith, and he sees Jesus. like, Jesus, tell me to come out there. If that is really you, tell me to come out there. I can walk on the water with you. And Jesus like, all right, dude, if this is what you want to do, come on out here. Come on, get out of the boat, walk with me. And Peter does that. He gets out of the boat and he begins to walk, but then he loses focus on Jesus. What does he do? He kind of starts to look around. (laughs) He's like, well, the wind's kind of pushing pretty hard and and blowing hard, and and the rain is kind of pelting me, and the waves are really big, and the boat's right there, but it's going all over the place. Peter's like, what am I doing? And he begins to sink in the water. Here's someone who said, hey, Jesus, I'm going to fully follow you. I'm going to give my life to you. He had this faith in Jesus, and yet what do we find right here? He still struggled with that faith. I look at myself, and I have this incredible faith in Jesus. I have this incredible faith in what God can do. If, uh, if you know much about spiritual gifts, what my number one, number two gift is this this spiritual gift of faith, like I know that God can do immeasurably more than I can imagine or ask. I just, I believe it, but you know what? I still struggle with my faith because I look at the world around and it's going crazy and I'm like, hey, why isn't God doing something about this? I, I look at the, the sin I struggle with. I'm like, hey, hey God, why, why, can't you, why can't you take this temptation away from me? When life feels overwhelming to me, it's one of those moments you're like, Jesus, can you, can you just take the will? Because it'd be great if you could drive for a little bit. Or I watch others suffer, and I wonder, why isn't God in the midst of this healing? Look, I, I've got this faith, and I've got this incredible faith, but I still struggle with that faith. And I find that there are times that I am sinking just like Peter. And by the, by the way, I'm, I'm guessing that there's some of you that are here today, some of you that are watching, that you're in the exact same boat. Well, I'm here to tell you today that that's that's normal. Continue to look at Peter. 
Peter kind of has this never give up attitude. It's a, after the Last Supper, Jesus has just finished this time with his disciples and he, he leads him out to the Mount of Olives. He's getting ready to be arrested in a very short period. And, um, and he has this conversation with his disciples. And in Matthew 26, starting with verse 31, it says, On the way, Jesus told them, Tonight, all of you will desert me. But Peter declared, even, even if everyone else deserts you, I will never desert you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter, this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that e you even know me. Like, again, isn't this one of those great Peter moments? Here's Peter's like, hey, Jesus, I'm all in. Like, hey, Jesus, no matter what happens, no matter what everybody else does, I'm not going anywhere. And Jesus is like, oh, by the way, you are. Hey, hey Peter, you're going to separate yourself fully from me. In fact, in a few short hours, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, no way, Jesus, not going to happen. I, I, I'm here for you. I'm by your side. I'm going to follow you. I'll fight for you. I'm going to be your bodyguard. I'm going to do everything I can. I am not going anywhere. And I look at this moment in Peter, and I think, that's me. Like, how many times am I like, oh, man, I am fully in Jesus. I'm going to do everything I can to follow you. I'm not going to give up on you. I'm going to push forward with you. I, I'm here for you. Just ask me. Invite me to do whatever it may be. And then again, I'm not very much different than Peter. Because if you look at the end of verse 26, or chapter 26, Peter denies knowing Jesus three times. And, and if you look at how that all kind of plays out, that pathway, each time these people come up, like, hey, didn't you hang out with Jesus? Didn't you, didn't you know Jesus? I just saw you, I think, like last week with Jesus. Weren't you part of Jesus' team? I'm pretty sure I, I, I've seen you with Jesus. And every time, if you kind of watch, G, or Peter gets more and more angry. He, he gets more and more demonstrative and like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know that guy. And in verse 75 of Matthew 26, it says, Suddenly, Jesus' words flash through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows, you will deny three times that you even know me. And he went away, weeping bitterly. Peter wants to fully follow Jesus. And if we look at what we read just before this, he's like, I'm not going to deny you, Jesus. I'm not going to give up on you, Jesus. I'm not going to separate myself from you, Jesus. And yet, what do we see with Peter? He does just that. When things got uncomfortable and there's a little fear there, he separates himself from Jesus. And you know what? I do that too. And when things feel uncomfortable, when I think I can do things on my own, for some reason I like to separate myself from Jesus also. But like Peter, every single time I realize something, that I can't do this on my own, that, that I can't do this alone, that I can't do this on, with my own strength, I'm not capable enough, I'm not spiritual enough, I don't have enough faith to, that I fully have to rely on who Jesus is. And yet I still decide too many times in my life to separate myself from Jesus. And I'm guessing that some, most, many, maybe all of you, do the exact same thing. But I'm here again today to tell you we're normal. A little bit further on in Peter's life, uh, we find in the book of Acts that uh, this thing called the church has begun. Peter has this amazing message, and you know the church was like 120 people, and then all of a sudden it's like 3,000 plus people, and it continues to grow. And and at this this moment, there's it's just these these messy people trying to figure it all out, right? Jesus is like, hey, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go into the world, make a difference, tell people about me, you know, teach them to obey the the teachings I gave you, baptize them, disciple them. This is your job. This is your role. And so this 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 messy group of people. With, put in this messy leadership and they have this messy structure of this church and they're reaching these messy people and, and, and yet uh, amazing things are happening the church is growing and, and, and as you you look at this what you you find is at the very beginning of the church it was only for jewish people these were the only people that were being reached god comes to peter and is like hey peter i need you to step out a little bit He's like, I know right now you've been kind of focused on these Jewish people, and that's great, and they're following Jesus, but there's actually more people out there who need to know the story of Jesus. And so he tells them, you need to go into the non-Jews. You need to go what they would call the Gentiles, and then begin to tell them about Jesus, begin to have them follow Jesus. And Peter's like, okay, let's do this. Let's make this happen. 
And so Peter goes into the Gentile world and he begins to talk to people who are far from God and he begins to tell them about Jesus. He begins to share with them the story of Jesus and they start following Christ. So here's Peter again. He's kind of looked at as one of the leaders in this Jerusalem church. He comes back to Jerusalem and it's Peter. His chest is probably puffed way far out. I mean, Peter's got a little bit of an ego there, right? And I'm sure he's like, hey, let me tell you these stories. Let me tell you how God used me. Let me, let me tell you these people that are now following Jesus. And as he's telling these people, some of his Jewish Christian friends pull him to the side. Like, Peter, what are you doing? Peter's like, oh, didn't you hear the stories? Let me tell you again. No, 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 no. We don't want you to tell us the stories anymore. Like, Peter, wh wh what are you doing? Because Jesus isn't actually for everyone. See, Peter, at that moment, he changes in the book of Galatians, which is actually a letter that a guy named Paul writes, in it he writes about this moment with Peter where he actually goes to Peter and he confronts Peter. And he says to Peter, he's like, Peter, what are you doing? He's like, Peter, at one point you're out there and you're reaching people that are far from God. You're, you're talking to these Gentiles and they're becoming followers of Jesus. But then you show back up in Jerusalem, Jerusalem and, and your Christian Jewish friends start talking to you and putting this pressure on you. And all of a sudden you stop. Like you stop hanging out with Gentiles. You stop interacting with them. You stop talking to them. What are you doing? You, you've kind of lost the mission that you've been called to. You, you've kind of lost this faith that you've been given. You've, you've gone to something safe. You've gone to something that you feel comfortable with, and these people are like you, and their, their minds think the same way, and there's not fear here, and you, you've stopped doing what Jesus has called you to do. You've forgotten about fully following Jesus. And, and I, I look at that piece with Peter and Paul, and, and I, I think to myself, that's me. I, I can get stuck in my Christian bubble. I can get stuck in my, my Christian world where the things that are most important to me, the only thing I want to do is to hang out with people that make it easy for me to hang out with them, that are minded the same way, that we think the same way, that we're, we're, we're in the, the same clubs together, right? We're, we're just alike. And I can forget that I've been called to more than that. I, I can forget that I've been called to, to reach those that are far from God, those that need to hear the story of Jesus. I can forget that we need to go beyond the walls of this church to reach those that are in our world at large. Because I can forget to love others unconditionally. Because this place is safe. Right? This place is protected. This place is, is easy. Again, most of the people here are just like me. And it makes it easier to say that I, I follow Christ. But the truth is, I'm not fully living out that mission. And here's my guess. Probably some of you fit into that same boat. You fit into that same area. Well, let me just tell you again today, that's normal. Again, I am normal. I struggle when it comes to faith. I struggle when it comes to sin. I struggle when it comes to loving unconditionally. I struggle when it comes to fully following Jesus. And just because I carry this title of pastor does not mean that I've got it all figured out. It does not mean that I am imperfect in, in any way, shape, or form. My relationships, I have to work at them. My marriage, I work at that. Being a dad, I have to work at that. I have a strong faith, but man, it's still lacking. And sometimes I'm sinking. And I have to remind myself that what I experience here, that that's just a part of my life. There's this whole world out there, people that are far from God, that I have been called as a follower of Christ to try to lead them to take their next steps in their faith journey with Jesus. And thankfully, there's somebody like Peter that I can look at and say, here's a guy that I feel is just like me. And yet here he is, he's fully trying to live this life that God has called him to live, and he's tempting to follow Jesus the best that he can, but sin still shows up, lack of faith is still there, struggles are there in his life, he makes poor decisions, and yet he still does all he can to follow Jesus. That, that's me. And again, I'm guessing that that is many of us here at the journey. But here's what I love about Peter. In the end, he was willing to give up his life for Jesus. Even through his sin, even through his denials, even through his bad decisions, bad choices, he still believed in who Jesus was. But we know that Peter was executed probably during the Neronian persecution of Christians and that 
time period of two or three years. Um, tradition says, and we don't know this exactly is what happened, tradition says he was crucified. There, there's some allusion to this and uh, discussion that Peter had with Jesus and some of the things Jesus says. It's very likely. But tradition says that he was, um, when he was getting ready to be crucified, he actually asked the executioners, he's like, can you actually crucify me upside down? He's like, I don't deserve to die like my Savior did. And I think about that, and again, uh, traditions here, maybe some conjecture, but I think no matter what, he still gave his life up for Jesus. Like he still believed. He, he may have been normal, but there was still this connection that he had with Jesus Christ. As we begin this series, uh, just as my reminder that, that I'm normal. Again, I'm not a super Christian. I'm not a super pastor. That I need Jesus as much as you do. Uh, Eugene Peterson is an author and pastor, and he said, the world does not need more of you, it needs more of God. And you don't need more of you, you need more of God. And if I can kind of take a play out of Peterson's uh, playbook, uh, Peterson wrote a book called The, Bi or the Message, and um, some people say it's a translation. It's not a translation, it's a paraphrase of Scripture. So I'm going to paraphrase what he just said. I would say it this way, the world does not need more of me, it needs more of God. And I don't need more of me. I need more of God, too. And so over the next three weeks, I want to share with you some more intense struggles and, and tensions that, that I have, and yet how I see God at work in each one. And I'm pretty positive each one of those I'm going to share are things that I think many of us can say, yep, yeah, hey, that's, that's me, too. But as we begin this series, there's a couple of things I want to put out there, some um, uh, hopes through this. The, the first thing is that through this series that Jesus will become central to us. Look, at, here at The Journey, Jesus is everything for us. Jesus is what we focus on. We are helping people take their next steps toward Jesus. We want to follow Jesus better. And we're not, we're not real good at that, right? We're always learning. We're always trying to grow from that. We still struggle. We, we still have this, these relationships we're working on. And that's okay. But if we can put Jesus first, it gives us something to always be working toward. It gives us something to believe in, a place to go. And it's putting that faith in Jesus. That's what Peter did. Even in all his messiness, he followed Jesus. In my messiness, I'm still trying to follow Jesus. In your messiness, I know that many of you, you're still trying to follow Jesus too. But Jesus has to become central. And the second thing I would say is that we do life together. You need to understand that if you're here at The Journey, this is not something where we've got our pastor or we've got our staff and they're separate from the rest of the church or you've got your group or your leader or your coach and you're separate from everything, everybody else. No, we, we do life together. And we're a bunch of messy people, okay? We're imperfect. We're trying to serve this perfect God. We're messy. We don't have our stuff together. But you know what? That's okay. Because again, I go back to these disciples that were following Jesus, and they were a messy ragtag group. And Jesus loved them tremendously, and Jesus used them, and God used them to do amazing things. And us together, in our messiness, in our struggles, in our tensions, in our broken relationships, and the things that we're facing in our sin, our poor decisions, I truly believe there's a God who fully loves us. And together, Together, we can change each other. We can be transformed. This church can be different. And oh, by the way, when we are living this life together, we're fully trying to live the commands Jesus gave us, our world will be a much better place to live. But it begins by understanding that you and me, hey, we're normal. I invite you to come back next week as we continue this series as talking about this faith thing because I think it's an important aspect of who we are and how my faith is, is something I struggle with even having this gift of faith and I know it's true for many of you too in fact I invite you to invite your non-Christian friends to be a part of the series I think it'd be amazing for them over the next three weeks to hear to what we have to say but let's begin today by understanding that you and I hey we're normal and we're in this together as we try to follow Jesus fully Let's pray. God, uh, thank you for uh, this morning, this, this moment together. Um, God, I, I know it's not 
sort of the normal stuff we expect to talk about on a Sunday morning. And, um, and God, as you know, this is not about me, but this is about just us as people that, that we, we face struggles and tensions and, and hardships and life, and um, it's hard. And we, we may look at other people and think, man, they got their stuff together because of what they do for a living, or you know, they got their stuff together because of the way they act, but the reality is we don't. We're all the same. We're, we're imperfect people, again, trying to follow you, this, this perfect God. And it's hard, and it's tough, and we get in the way, and we separate ourselves, but you still love us. And the fact you loved us so much, you sent Jesus to this earth as a gift to us, a gift we didn't deserve, a gift that, that gives us hope for now, it gives us hope for our future, and of course, it gives us hope for eternity, and for that, we say thank you. And so God, help us to realize we're all normal and we're in this together and that through it all that Jesus will become more and more central to our lives and to the world around us so that more and more people can know who he is and live this life of following him the best that they can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Devin. Uh, we're going to take a moment to do communion together. So if you're at home, go ahead and grab some crackers or juice. If you're here in the building, hopefully you grabbed one of these out in the lobby. Uh, there was something about Easter this year that made me really appreciate that we do this moment together every week. Remember that sacrifice that he made for us. So why don't you take with me the bread, break it, um, to remember how his body broke for us. And then the juice we take together to remember his blood that was spilled for us. Thank you, Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord, thank you for this moment where we can remember how you gave of your life, how you sacrificed so that we could be with you, that we could be reunited with you. Thank you, Lord, for the message of unity that permeates everything you taught us. To be one with you, to be one with each other. Thank you that we are in it all together, that you're there holding our hands, guiding us through this life. Thank you for this morning where we, as a body, get to love and worship you and learn more about you. I pray that the things Chad taught us would stick in our heart this week, would turn over in our minds, that we would leave this place with a heart full of worship. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you are. We praise you. We bless you. Amen. All right, let's sing one more song of worship together. Go ahead and stand to your feet today. All the normal people in the house. With everything that you are, even though we're not perfect. Let's give it up to every praise in him. Every praise. To our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah, sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Take it up one, every praise. Every praise is to our God. Every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. We're not perfect, Father, but we sing it high. Sing hallelujah to our God.
And God is good. And all the time. Amen. I'm excited about this series. Chad is finally going to tell it like it is. People think that I like sit around and play guitar and do worship music all day. And <laughs> Anyway, thank you for joining us. We will see you right back here online next week. Stay cool. Stay blessed. Stay in touch.